There we go. Good evening, everybody. <clears throat> I've written probably 30 books altogether. <laughs> One of them I wrote, I drink from memories well, waking up from an automatic automatic existence. I didn't I didn't put a lot of effort into the marketing of it. It's done very well so far. I mean, I sell sell some every month, but the uh, when I look back at the stuff that I wrote when I first started writing, I look at it and I'm like, man, I <laughs> it sucks <laughs> to be honest uh, compared to what I'm writing now. And since I've writ, I wrote Life and the Love of Life. Uh, after I wrote a drink from Amber's Well, I'm looking through it and I'm, you know, some of this needs to be changed. Some of this is still good. Some of it really did anything, but. There's a part in here in a drink from Emmer's Well called Friga and the Loss of Boulder. What's up, man? How you doing? <laughs> I'm going to talk about parenting. <laughs> and that's such a touchy subject because I, I, I see some people come into heathenry and, and um, first thing they want to start doing is talking about, hey, I, uh, this is how I was raised and it was hard and it was tough and it made me into the man I am and and my first thought is always, no, it made you into the man that fucked up so badly he had to change the spiritual foundation of his life. So I don't put a lot of stock in that. Now, granted, there's some stuff in there that I think is essential as far as uh, making your kids deal with life on life's terms and not yours. Um, but I, I find some of the lessons and the answers to that in the free again Balder. And I'm going to read a little bit about it, and I hope you enjoy it as much as I enjoyed writing it. <laughs> Let's see if I can do a, a halfway decent job with it. I see many parents who are absolutely certain that, that parenting centers around doing the right things. That's just how it revolves. They assume the role that they believe is theirs by the standards of their society. They are doing the dad thing. They are being the mom. They're doing that stuff that they see everybody give them positive feedback on social media. <laughs> in a similar fashion, we see how the second generation of rig are named by what they can do and attitudes they hold. They take great pride in the act of doing. People all too often get caught up in the doing of many things. The whole world is caught up in doing this or doing that, sometimes seemingly rushing from one inane task to the next. Now, we've changed the platform where we cry for... Uh, um, acceptance from it, from one of publishing and word of mouth to the digital instant gratification of social media platforms, but uh, we're still rushing around. Now with social media, we're rushing around all the faster. The scurrying is, an, is, a, is astonishing sometimes. They run from one task to the next, and all the while they might feel some, they, if they get enough done, they'll somehow feel complete. And what we're doing is teaching our children this artificial sense of urgency. As we see with this second generation of rig and, and the lay of rig, it kind of limits their potential. And also true, we've almost poisoned the well, so to speak, with catchphrase deeds, not words. See, it's the whole litmus test of you being worthwhile to enter the hall in the lore is whether you can question and answer well. Not whether you can open the door. I have approached this subject from many angles, but I have never, from the role of a parent, touched upon it. I briefly spoke about it in Spiritual Journey of a Woman <laughs> as a means to bring clarity to how young men might embrace masculinity and how young women might accept their powerful femininity. See, it's a fairly complicated subject all on its own. <laughs> now we're going to tackle the very difficult problem of being a parent. With regards to Odin, Frigga, and Balder, no one would doubt that they are each a powerful, divine being who are in some respects equal to each other. In fact, Balder takes the place of, of at least one of them we know for sure at, after Ragnarok. He grows up to become something more. Yet when we, are, yet when we parent a child... Most of us will never make the connection that the unique properties of life are every bit as equal in our children as they are in us. And that's a weird thing to think about. Sure, we may be much bigger than them, with more experiences, but the aspect of life, consciousness itself, which animates every 
part of that of the of the child is every bit the same in them as it is in us. The experience you cherish as wisdom is temporary. Whether or not you want to admit it, that life energy is equal to yours. The divine spark in you is no greater than that of a newborn child. In fact, it may be much dimmer and less pure than the newborn who has not been taught all the crippling behaviors we think we need to survive in this world. Much of the effort we put into, into developing our faith has to do with undoing all that we have learned to allow that spark to shine again. A newborn comes into this world with that spark fully functioning and influencing everyone around them. Think about that. Think about the sway of influence a newborn child has with the simple smile and the, and the giggle of a baby. The most heinous of crimes are ones committed against this pure spark of life. And this is, I'm going to leave that right there. And that is where fear comes into play. When we adopt the role of parent, and it is a role, we might sometimes think that my child shouldn't have to suffer. Hi, Brenda. <laughs> as far as the idea of role is concerned, let, re let me remind you all of the silly voices and faces we make to secure the attention of our children. We're playing a role there. The revolt of most teenagers is a revolt against this concept. <laughs> The example of Frigga taking that idea to the extreme to protect her great son is an important lesson. It is also a powerful tool for teaching us that when our identity becomes far too intricately wound up in the role of parent, we are at risk of creating suffering for not only ourselves, but the child, for when the time for being a parent no longer feeds that artificial sense of self, we lose the sense of urgency and satisfaction from constantly doing that. We have the obligation to protect and care for the gift of life which has been placed in our charge. <laughs> Bad Santa all of a sudden, man. <laughs> we're, we're there to... We have the obligation to protect and care for the gift of life which has been placed in our charge. We don't own it. Sure, there is a need to tell the child what to do and what not to do for their own safety, but when we adopt the identity of parent as ours, we will run the risk of doing our best to make sure others know we are doing our best. Our efforts become exaggerated and begin to carefully feed a craft persona based on an ego. It is insidious in its nature, and we might go from giving the child what they need to outright spoiling them. I do it, Scarlet. Sometimes our attitudes towards the safety of our child pushes us to become overprotective. I see lots of young mothers up at Scarlet School with their first child, hoovering over them all the time. We become controlling and hinder the natural desire to explore this world they have been thrust into. I have seen many parents who believe that their role as parent resides in their ability to control their child through sheer force of will and the certainty that they are right. Success in this effort always allows them to hold their head high as doing the right thing, and the child's not bothering me anymore. I mean, that's the real deal. The child's no longer pestering me. All the while, building resentment within the child. The child simply wants some attention. You brought me into this world. How about paying some attention to me? Hmm? I mean, there's a dynamic there happening. People don't even, don't even pay attention to it. <laughs> All the while, especially when the dynamics of this function change over time, and they do change over time. The role of protector is quite different for a toddler as compared to a 40-year-old adult. Yet many parents cannot seem to help themselves. You will always be my baby, is a common phrase, one which seems to be full of love, but much of it is grounded in fear. All of us have a very hard time imagining what would happen if we lost a child. We cannot fathom the depths of emotional pain one must endure in such a scenario. So what I'm talking about is really measured in degrees. Not all or nothing. It all depends upon your ability to be aware of this happening. None of us would willingly grab a red hot poker, would we? When it comes time to cut the apron string, so to speak, there is an immense amount of resistance to the idea. Our own minds thrust these ideas of permanent and crippling loss into the mix, and our ego feeds on it like a vampire. Keep it, keeping it going day in and day out for some people. 
These are people who have difficulty not being needed by their child once the necessity of it is long past. There is an unconscious fear of loss of their identity from the role they have played for so long. At this point, though, it is being done out of an instinct for the survival of a person's ego. There is not a relationship free of the conditional responses of a dependent nature. There is a powerful need to ensure that they preserve the role of parent. If you do something for 20 years, it's awfully hard to break that habit. Many people are absolutely convinced that all they are doing is showing concern for the child. Yet when the advice of the parent is ignored, here comes the guilt trips. The clear indication of someone trying to preserve a cleverly disguised idea of self-enhancement. Somewhere along the way, I became aware of the fact that my mother knew all of the stupid things I was doing. And somewhere along the way, I became aware of the fact that she was simply sitting there waiting on me to make the right decision. That was a powerful lesson for me to learn that my mother was sitting there gritting her teeth thinking, come on, Brian, get it together. But not jumping in there with both feet to do this role of mother and create the drama in the scenario. Brian, blah, 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 blah. I'm sure she said it to a lot of people. But to me, she gave me love and said, keep trying. That's that's valuable. That was the kind of experience I needed to become something more. Hell, I guess. I don't know. I'm still practicing at it. <laughs> see, all of us have um, the carefully crafted. Let's see. Where'd I go? All of us have accepted the title and role of parent to do our best to love our children. I mean, that's just inherent. I mean, there's there's few things more powerful than loving a child, a child loving you. We love them in the way we were taught. Wouldn't it be grand if we could spare our children the suffering we know that life sometimes brings? This is from uh, Drink from Memer as well. Um, it's the uh, the first part of the book is about some stuff with a half a mall, but as I wrote it, I changed my thought process, changed and ended up writing an entirely different book than when I started. <laughs> but at some point, we should consider that this is that this very thing which may be what the child needs to become who they are supposed to become. Who are we to actively remove all of the challenges in front of a separate being's life? Perhaps those challenges are what they need to become something more. That is their road. That is their path. They need to do that to grow. Our job is to help them create a thinking process so that they aren't building barricades in front of themselves as they try to move forward. <laughs> but Frigga went one above that. She went out to she went out of her way with this effort and Balder was Balder was still placed in a situation he had to deal with all his own. She secured from everything a promise that they would not harm him. So in typical youthful fashion, all him and his buddies get together and it's all hold my beer, hey, watch this, and they're throwing an axe at him, and nothing refuses, everything refuses to harm him, except for one thing, mistletoe, which was too young to cause any pain. Loki figured it out. He got the blind man at the edge of the crowd and says, you know, why ain't you a part of this? Why ain't you in there with all the cool kids? Hey, check this out, man. I got something for you. Shoot this arrow. And let's see what happens. And with that, he stole the light of the world. <laughs> and brought to fruition the worst fear of a mother and father. <laughs> Who knows what Odin's final words were to his son. One would like to think that they were the kind of inspiration from a loving father to help a son through the dark times of his own. Whatever it was, it allowed a course of events to unfold so that Balder might occupy a throne of his own. In a world which was ready for the radical shift of consciousness necessary for it to bloom again. Simply put, he was given a chance to evolve outside of the typical setbacks one sees between parents and children. The carefully crafted manipulations to ensure an adult child or teenager does what the parent believes they ought to be doing is an unconscious desire to fulfill that need which resides in the parent and not the child. Our attempts to make our children feel uncomfortable or guilty so that they will accomplish what we could not is a huge part of the lesson from Baldur's death. We cannot use the same methods of protecting the babe to secure a relationship with the adult. These tactics of manipulation only lead to pain for both parties. 
the knowledge of what is best for our children diminishes with their age. From the spell of Groa to Frigga securing a promise from everything on Midgard to not harm her son to Achilles' mother dipping him in the river Styx to make him invulnerable, mothers have done their best to protect their children far beyond the cradle, and in those cases it leads to an early grave. Even in Pink Floyd's The Wall, think about mother. Um, oh my gosh, what are the lyrics to that song about mother? Mother, will they try to break my balls? <laughs> it's this very powerful song about the overreaching influence of this mother on this young man who lost his father, who does not have a masculine identity in his home. Um, that's another part of it. It's a modern day telling of that very same tale. This extreme set of example from centuries to go and, you know, a couple of decades ago, suggests that there is a wisdom we have yet to learn. When we thrust upon our children the hopes and desires we had for ourselves, the vicarious football player's dad, which we may have failed at, as fathers are wont to do. And we expect them to do it in our stead. We are stealing from them the magnificence of the life they were born into this world for. One which is of their own creation, not ours. We must sometimes step back and allow them the opportunity to handle the hurdles of life all on their own. I'm so, I, I could not be more grateful that that somewhere along the way I discovered that my mother had the ability to do that for me. And I've been in some shitty situations. And all of them were of my own creation. Every single one of them was because there was something that I screwed up. I could have handled something better. I could have reacted differently. I could have not reacted at all. I could have kept my nose out of the nose candy. You know, I could have stopped drinking. I could have, you know, quit looking at, you know, some ass over here. I mean, there's all of these things that, that I have done in life that have led me to the situations I'm in. <laughs> I don't know if it caused her enough pain that she had to back away and not be a part of it anymore or what. But somewhere along the way, I was blessed with the idea that I had a maternal figure and a father for that matter that could back up and say, buddy, you got to figure it out. That's a good thing. The lasting impression of this overprotective and possessive type of parenting will last into adulthood. How many adults today worry about a couple of thoughts they believe from their parents? Number one, you aren't good enough. Number two, you will never amount to anything. And many more will struggle with the constant thought of, my parents should accept me as I am. Just as the parents are still playing their games, we are still playing ours. The victim mentality is so powerfully associated with emotional pain. Once we become fully aware of the life within us, the clarity of which was fertilized by faith, there follows an understanding that nothing about you is diminished by the negative thoughts of your parents. We are not obligated to act in the same manner our parents have to be, con have to be considered a success, but it is far easier to get caught up in the business of doing, isn't it? Like a carrot on a stick, if we do enough, we might be saved from the difficult tasks of allowing children to grow. We front load their existence with the same pattern as our own. Be busy. You won't have time to focus on anything you might feel. We are inadvertently teaching them avoidance. And as soon as they find video games, they realize they don't need to put in nearly as much effort as you did to achieve the same result. The tired, worn-out parent will become resentful. Just look at all the work they must do to tread water above their emotional depths while the child simply plays a game. <laughs> Have you done your homework, clean your room, mowed the lawn, brush your teeth? Hurry up, get ready, get to bed, get up. These are all necessary tasks, but if the limit of your interaction with your child, it is minus a vital component of building a relationship with a being who is your legacy. Given our stature as adults, we are physically bigger in every sense of the word to a child. Our children will look up to us, both figuratively and literally. When we become angry or upset, they will instinctively feel very small. Perhaps you remember this. It may be what your mother, mother or father had done. Not having any instruction, guess what? It is what you are going to do as well. 
To yell at a child until the stress of it inspires the body to release the chemicals of that st stress through tears does not foster those feelings of love children need. It is a sign that the love of the parent is conditional, intermittent, and shows an attitude of possession rather than presence. And present is what a child, all children need. Take a look around you. How many adults or children do you know that have felt they were in receipt of their parents' full and loving attention? All of us have some kind of damage from growing up. That's just the way it is. Our parents have all had shortcomings. But in their eyes, those shortcomings were how they were going to survive this world and raise a family. Most people will deny this. They have embraced this wound and built an ego around it like a great pressure dressing. They will live their lives in accordance with whatever allows them to maintain this triage of emotional pain. Keep a stiff upper lip and all that. In the insanity of this world, those of us, and also true, have a powerful opportunity not to further this sickness. We have the opportunity to avoid compounding the injury itself by not living our lives around this idea. I've seen lots of people who spend countless hours remembering how this or that situation caused them great pain. Again and again, the incessant pattern of thoughts reminds us of some point in time when the emotions and pains overwhelmed us. For far too long, many of us waited, prayed, and hoped something would come along and take that pain away. It shapes our opinions about life and how our children ought to be raised. Never once do we consider that this is not our thought process, our constant torture of ourselves which allowed us to survive. You see, none of those incidents reduce the quality of who you are, not by one jot. Yet our egos will tell us every day that they did. You might even begin to believe we deserved these injuries. That there is nothing which might minimize the gifts you have been given by the divine. True, you may hoard them or treat them in a niggardly fashion, but you cannot reduce the quality of them. They are part and parcel of the spiritual being which resides in this mortal shell. What is even more painful is when we come to the realization that these perceptions of our own problems have manifested to create the same ugliness in the lives of our children. How far have we come from inviting the divine into our homes, such as in the lay of rig? We have built egos in their place to wallow in the morbid comfort of our ego-inspired pain, such as the plight of Loki, for his own pain creates suffering for everyone around him. The key to being present is capturing a perspective on these wounds which allows us to stop reliving them or forecasting them and be in this moment right here and right now. This moment is the only place where the divine might begin to operate in our lives. How many single parent families have what it takes to be fully present when their children are talking to them? Most of them are caught up in the doing just to survive in this world. See, that kind of mindset is extremely difficult to shut off, but we must if we are to give our children the attention so many of them are in need of. Too many of us allow our woes to keep us awake at night, and in the morning, everything is still the same as it was. There's a big clue for us right there. Just how important is anything on your to-do list? These concepts only become magnified if there is a divorce. The worst aspects of ego and being a victim emerge in all their painful glory. Many times I have seen women stand to their ground, so to speak, because the father hasn't paid his child support, thereby giving her the authority to feel more than the father. But this idea will usually parade itself around as a victim. He hasn't done enough to support me. Whenever I and me are in the same thought, you can bet the person has a powerfully vested interest in maintaining their role, which is actually their ego. More often than not, both parents in this situation end up playing the victim to feed a negative emotional state. And while it is true that many fathers have bowed out completely with regards to their children and mothers as well, some of them are incarcerated or are lost in their own world of drug abuse or adolescent behavior. Unless they are a true danger to the child, aside from threatening your ego, the parent should always be involved in the life of this child. Do you know what happens when either parent is not there? The child will internalize that action. They might wonder what they've done wrong for mom or dad to stop loving them. But in the long run, after they are grown, they will think to themselves, I turned out okay, my kids will too. No, 
The only thing we have done is ensure that our children indulge in, foster, and live with the exact same kind of pain we have. They will consider it normal. It is the only thing they've been taught. The madness of our world, you know, our politicians and the media feed off of that very kind of thing. The one thing I encourage my son to do with his son is one of the most important things you can do as a parent. Get down on the floor with that child and become a part of their world. When you are paying attention to them, really paying attention to them, look them in the eye and tell them, I see you, I hear you, and I love you. Be present in their life and recognize them. Do not let the artificial stress of some deadline rob you of this joy of being present. Shift the focus of your thoughts from yesterday and tomorrow to right now. What is placed squarely in front of you, this is the only thing you can actually do anything about. Soon enough, as they grow older, you'll be able to tell them how proud of them you are. The powerful patterns of respect, courage, and the ability to do the right thing because they believe in themselves will form as they are needed. Especially if they are growing up knowing that someone else has believed in them all along. I have read that when we love someone, we recognize ourselves in another. When we have the courage to set aside the role society expects us to play and handle the task at hand because they are the right thing to do, we are well on our way to eliminating the sway of ego in our lives. When we no longer use our role to enhance, aggrandize, or corrupt our personalities and can become comfortable in our own skin, we will find that new dimension. We'll see you around, buddy. A dimension of being which allows us to relax and to handle the magnificently rewarding burden of being a parent by simply being present in the moment and enjoying the opportunity you've been given. Thank you all for joining me. Like I say, that's in a drink for me as well. You know, I look at, I've, I've, I've already written another book and a half since then. I look at, I'd like to rewrite that in a dozen different ways because of what I've learned. But I think, isn't that what it's all supposed to be about? you got to take a look at it and say, well, maybe I changed my mind about that. There's a lot of that in there I could probably expand and expound upon. I doubt if I'm going to change my mind much about it. Especially the part about when you're being present in a child's life, be present in a child's life. Be right there. It's hard to do when we're suckered into playing a game on the phone or what's going on on Facebook or writing a book. But when they look you in the eye, look them in the eye, they realize that that wonderful spark of life that you're sitting there holding, which is every bit as magnificent of yours, is looking to you for something special. Be that special. Well, you know, isn't it something?